In the history of 19th century British colonisation, the Maori of New Zealand stand unique in that they are the only warlike race that voluntarily agreed to accept the sovereignty of the Crown. Recognising the superiority of the British and, fearing rumours of French expansionism in the Pacific, the majority of Maori leaders agreed to, and signed, the Treaty of Waitangi, bringing them under the protection of the Empire. In return, they retained the right of ownership of their land, selling areas they wished to release, but only to the government. It all sounded very cosy, but, of course, it didn't quite work out that way. First sighted by Dutchman Abel Tasman in 1642 and circumnavigated and mapped by Cook in 1769, New Zealand, home of the Maori, was largely left alone by the expanding empires of Europe. The only contact were numerous European and North American whaling, sealing and trading ships. They traded European food, metal tools, weapons and other goods for timber, fresh food, artefacts and fresh water. As part of the British settlement in New South Wales in 1788, the first governor Arthur Phillips' area of commission included New Zealand, but struggling to establish the colony at Sydney prevented him from expanding to the area. It wasn't until the 1830s that any form of colonisation began, when James Busby was appointed the British resident in New Zealand. Later, in 1840, he and William Hobson, the first Governor of New Zealand, co-authored the Treaty of Waitangi, first signed on the 6th of February 1840 by Busby and Hobson as representatives of the British Crown and Maori chiefs from the North Island of New Zealand. But there was a problem. The treaty was of course bilingual, written in English and translated into Maori. Unfortunately, the two didn't quite agree. The main area of difference was that the Maori text granted governance rights to the Crown, while the English text cedes all rights and powers of sovereignty to the Crown. This meant that as far as the British were concerned, they were now in charge of the place, but the Maori had only signed up to the British helping them look after the place. The treaty also stated that the land belonged to the Maori, and while they could sell areas of land, they could only do so to the British government for an agreed price. It was these land sales and dodgy dealings by the government, pressurised by land-hungry settlers, that was to lead to what would become known as the Maori Wars. The wars were, in fact, a series of localised conflicts between New Zealand colonial government and allied Maori on one side, and Maori and Maori allied settlers on the other. Though the wars were initially triggered by tensions over disputed land purchases, they escalated dramatically from 1860, as the government became convinced it was facing a united Maori resistance to further land sales and a refusal to acknowledge the Crown's sovereignty and the terms of the Treaty of Waitangi. The first sign of trouble happened on the 17th of June 1843 in the Wairu Valley on the South Island. A group of settlers, wavering a fraudulent deed to a land sale, attempted to clear Maori off the land. Fighting broke out. Four Maori and 22 British settlers were killed. Robert Fitzroy, the second governor of New Zealand, investigated the incident and exonerated the Maori, for which he was strongly criticised by the settlers. The first time British armed forces became involved was in 1845, in a conflict known as the Flagstaff War. The conflict is best remembered for the actions of Honeheke, who challenged the authority of the British by cutting down a flagstaff flying the Union flag, rather than the flag of the United Tribes of New Zealand. The mast was reinstalled but cut down twice more as a signal of open defiance and contempt for British authority. The fourth attack on Tuesday the 11th of March was a far more serious affair. A force of about 600 Maori, armed with muskets, double-barrel guns and tomahawks, attacked the town. Honaheke's men attacked the guard post, killing all of the defenders and cutting down the flagstaff for a fourth time. The garrison of about 100 men managed to hold a perimeter while the town was evacuated to ships moored in the bay. 13 soldiers and civilians died in the battle. The colonial government attempted to re-establish its authority with the arrival of troops from the 58th 
96th and 99th Regiments and a detachment of Royal Marines, and a series of attacks on several local Maori fortified villages followed. But despite their military superiority, including rockets, the Maori were no easy beats. Because of almost constant inter-tribal warfare, defensive fortifications have reached a very high level among the Maori. A village was usually sited on top of a hill, surrounded by timber palisades and trenches. Since the introduction of muskets, the Maori had learned to cover the outside of the palisades with layers of flax leaves, making them effectively bulletproof. The British were to discover, to their considerable cost, that a defended Maori village was a difficult fortification to defeat. The Flagstaff War lasted 10 months, until January 1846, when the economic strain imposed on the Maori and the disruption of food supplies and epidemics that resulted in significant numbers of deaths compelled them to seek a ceasefire. While the war was widely lauded as a British victory, this was far from the case. With 246 killed and wounded, they had taken far more casualties than they had expected, and trouble was brewing elsewhere. Various minor battles took place over the next 20 years with long pauses between outbreaks, usually started because of disputed land sales and the insatiable appetite by white settlers for more and more land. At the peak of the hostilities in the 1860s, 18,000 British troops, supported by artillery, cavalry and local militia, battled about 4,000 Maori warriors in what became a gross imbalance of manpower and weaponry. British troop and civilian deaths total about 750. Maori losses exceeded 2,100. The result was, of course, predictable. British numbers and weaponry won out, and the Maori lost large areas of land, supposedly confiscated as punishment for their so-called rebellion, although about half of this was subsequently paid for or returned to Maori control. The legacy of the New Zealand wars continues today, but these days the battles are mostly fought in courtrooms and around the negotiation table. Numerous reports have criticised Crown actions during the wars, but also found that the Maori too breached the treaty. As part of the negotiated out-of-court settlements of tribes' historical claims, as of 2011, the Crown is making formal apologies and financial compensation to the affected tribes. The medal, issued for service in the Maori Wars, officially known as the New Zealand Medal, was sanctioned on the 1st of March 1869. Recipients that had served in any of the conflicts between 1845 and 1866 were entitled to receive the award, but unlike previous campaigns, in order to get the medal, the recipient had to have actually landed and served in the field against the enemy in New Zealand. This condition somewhat restricted the number of medals eventually awarded because unlike previous medals, naval crews that stayed aboard their ships providing vital support for ground troops were not entitled to the medal. The New Zealand medal breaks new ground in the series of Victorian campaign medals in a number of different ways. Firstly, and for the first time since 1840, we see a different design on the obverse or front of the medal. The new image, designed by brothers Joseph and Alfred Wyon, bears a slightly older Queen Victoria, facing left, crowned, and with a veil covering the back of her head. Surrounding her is a Latin legend, which, when translated, is a shortened form of Victoria, by the grace of God, Queen of the Britons, Defender of the Faith. The reverse is unique in that it depicts the years served in New Zealand by the recipient, the only time this ever happens on a British medal. The years are surrounded by a laurel wreath. Above the wreath are the words New Zealand, and below another Latin phrase which translates to honour of valour. The medal disc is suspended from its ribbon by a straight bar swivelling suspender, ornamented with fern fronds in a nod to the flora of the country. This design is again unique to the New Zealand medal. The ribbon is dark blue with a wide red stripe down the centre. The rim of the medal is impressed with the recipient's name, number, regiment and, for those above private, their rank. No clasps were issued for the medal, so it is not possible to say where the recipient may have fought. 
and while the dates of service are struck on the reverse of the medal, this can be a trap for the researcher, as it only tells us that the recipient was in the area at the time and does not confirm his involvement at any particular action. Given the various possible ranges of dates for service, the Mint was tasked with producing 29 different medals, 28 of which bore a date or dates and one blank one. The blank one seems to have been mainly for local volunteers and militia units who were resident in New Zealand and therefore present throughout the wars. Most of the dated medals depict a range of dates, like this one, dated 1860 to 1861, but others can show a shortened service like this one for the single year of 1866. The longest period shown on an awarded medal was 1846 to 1865, of which only one was awarded. In total, approximately 4,400 medals were eventually issued. The medal shown here was awarded to Henry Haynes of the 50th Regiment. Henry was born in Worcester in 1839, the son of a needlemaker, and enlisted in the 50th in October 1857, aged 18. Discharged at Edinburgh Castle in 1879, having served 21 years with five years overseas in Ceylon and six years in the Australian colonies. Despite his name appearing eight times in the defaulter's book and three times being court-martialed, at his discharge he was in possession of three good conduct badges and would have had a fourth had he not been promoted to sergeant. The New Zealand was his only campaign medal. Thank you for watching and join us again next time when we look at medals awarded for the Abyssinian War of 1868.